1 Kings 17, we're going to talk about Elijah and Elisha tonight. I want to paint a picture of a classic example of how Old Testament and New Testament were meant and designed to work together. Um, I'm fully convinced that the Old Testament is one big picture, a story. And the New Testament is a living reality. So I can take a picture of my kids and hang them up on my wall, and you'll get one glimpse of who they are. But in the New Testament, you get a living reality of who God is. Okay? So for me, the Old Testament is picture, and I shouldn't say one huge picture, but multiple pictures, types and shadows, opportunities for us to catch glimpses of who the Lord is or who we are in Him. But then the New Testament, I believe, it's almost as if the veil truly is moved away and we begin to see the Lord for who He really is, a living reality, not just symbols and pictures and things we have to dig out. Proverbs 25 talks about this, that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and it's the glory of kings to search it out. Okay? I believe that's what the Old Testament's about. I believe it's a huge treasure chest that we're to dig out and find the Lord in the midst of it. And 1 Kings 17 into uh, 2 Kings gives us a picture of a very interesting relationship between two guys whose names are almost exactly alike, Elijah and Elisha. You probably have heard these names before, but I'm not sure how many of us have really taken the time to kind of study out these stories and what they actually mean uh, to us. So I'm actually going to start right there in 1 Kings 17, starting in verse 1. And I want to start bringing out some pictures for you and then connect it to a relationship in the New Testament. Let's just start reading. Verse 1 of 1 Kings 17. Everybody there? 1 Kings 17? Okay. Well, thank you. I'll pray about that. Feel free to pray about that, too. Okay. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, Surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him. Can you guys just do me a favor? If you, do you guys have pens? Oh, we're all using our phones now. <laughs> I, can I can highlight it. If you'd like. <laughs> you'd like. I can highlight it. I'm officially too old. Anyway, the phrase, the word of the Lord came to him, is the, is the phrase I'd like to kind of highlight tonight. The word of the Lord came to him who is Elijah saying, Go away from here. Turn eastward, eastward, not eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. And it shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. There it is again. For he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat. Why did they bring him bread and meat? Lord commanded them to. And meet in the evening, bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. And it happened after a while, so as you think about the brook, <laughs> just listen to the soothing drip <laughs> that continues. I'm actually hoping it freezes to <laughs> just <laughs> it For those of you that are on the video, we have a very strong leak happening in our roof right now. It happened after a while that the book, brook dried up, in Jesus' name, <laughs> because there was no rain in the land. We don't want that. We just want the brook. Then the word of the Lord came to him. There it is again. So far, three times already. <clears throat> saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded, there it is again, a widow there to provide for you. So, so far, ravens have been commanded to provide for him, and a widow is commanded to provide for him. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please, get me a little jar that I may drink. Give me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, 
And while you're at it, bring me a piece of bread. But she said, as the Lord God lives, I have no bread. Only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And then Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go, do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake for it first, from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you will make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. She said, and she and he and her, sorry, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was never exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. Okay, so I want to start just doing some simple comparisons here. You'll understand why in a little bit more after this. So, one of the phrases that we see, we're just through 16 verses of 1 Kings 7, is that we see this phrase often. The word of the Lord came. Okay? The idea is that Elijah's hearing the Lord speak to him. And when the Lord speaks to Elijah, he goes and he does whatever the Lord tells him to do. Okay? And on top of that, we also see uh, we see the word commanded several times. Okay? And that was the ravens were commanded to do things. And then the widow was it the widow? Yeah. The widow was commanded to do things. Okay? We see those phrases throughout. And then later on, uh, I don't want to read the entire story here because it's it's a little time consuming. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of an update on what happens here, uh, Elijah stays with the widow. Uh, the widow's son gets sick and dies. And Elijah takes the, the boy upstairs to an upper room away from mom and basically cries out to the Lord and says, Hey, look, you're the one that told me to come and to hang out with this lady and allow her to provide for me. And then look what happens while I'm here. The boy dies. Okay? And in the process... I, I really don't think it's a, it's fair. I don't think it's appropriate. I mean, this is me putting the story. But he says, basically, I, can, you, can you take care of this situation? And the Lord does. And Elijah prays for the boy. And the boy uh, raises from the dead. A resurrection takes place. He breaks him back down and says, see, your son is alive. Verse 24, then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth it is true. The word of the Lord is in your mouth. Is true. Okay? Next story in chapter 18 is and now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came. There it is again. The word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. And then Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys, and perhaps we will find grass and keep the horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. This is a bad famine. Drought. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way and Obadiah went the other. Now, as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, my master? He said to him, It is I. Go say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. Then it goes into a story about how Ahab wants to meet Elijah to try to end this drought. Okay? He actually, Ahab, when he finds him, actually calls Elijah, O troubler of Israel, verse 17. Um, that's an interesting phrase. Well, Ahab is the real troubler of Israel. Because it says in 18, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have. Because you have forsaken, what? The commandments of the Lord. And you have, not fo and you have followed the Baals. Now then, send and gather to me all, the, all Israel and Mount Carmel, at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. These are 850 prophets of a 
fake false god that all of Israel is following after, including Ahab and Jezebel. Okay? Many of you might, might know this story that happens after this. There's basically a standoff between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, where they basically say, let's say, you call down fire from Baal, I'll call down fire from God, and we'll see who answers. You guys know that? Yeah. Okay, we know that story. And at the end of it, they're there. Those 450 prophets, they are jumping up and down. They're screaming. They're shouting. It actually says that they're cutting themselves, begging Baal to come down and light their offering on fire. And they don't. it's all silent. There's no heaven, no sound from heaven. He, uh, Elijah then does the same thing and basically he even does this. This is really cool. He sets up a pillar, sets up a, an offering, sets up 12 stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And then on top of it, he pours four times water all over his offering. He's like, you know, whoever wants to light a fire, but the first thing you do is pour water all over your wood. Okay? That's how convinced he is that the Lord's going to answer him. We know that the rest of the story is he cries out to the Lord. The Lord consumes the offering, consumes the wood and fire. And then the next thing Elijah does is he takes all the prophets and kills them. Okay? So, next break, uh, it, it, then it goes into, uh, I think, is it chapter 19? I can't remember exactly if it starts in 19 or not. But basically, uh, I think it's in 19 that a Jezebel, who is Ahab's wife, finds out that Elijah has just killed all her prophets. Okay. Jezebel's not very happy. And so Jezebel makes this edict across all of Israel. Let it be so to me that by the end of this day, Elijah isn't like those same prophets that he just killed. In other words, he basically puts out a death warrant. We have to the end of the day and we're killing Elijah. Okay? So turn to uh, 1 Kings 19. I'm trying to help kind of skip through some of the story to kind of get to the overall picture I want to show you all. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Now he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, meaning the prophets that he killed, by tomorrow at this time. He was afraid. I'll tell you what, one woman can scare a man. Especially a Jezebel, a woman of authority, who rules her husband. You'll find out if you read the whole story of Jezebel. Ahab's really not the king. Jezebel is. And Elijah, as powerful of the prophet as he is, a man who hears the word of the Lord, obeys the word of the Lord, does what the Lord tells him to do, calls down fire from heaven. This guy was a guy who called fire down on a wet offering, consumes it, and one lady says, I'm going to kill you, and it says this, he was afraid, verse 3, and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. My goodness. This is a guy who just a few hours ago stood in front of 850 prophets he slew them. Look, it's hard enough to slew one person. This guy took the time to slow, slay, whatever the word is. Slay rod. 850 guys by the sword. And yet one woman says, I'm going to take you out. And he says, that's it, I'm ready to die. It's crazy. He lay down and slept under the juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him and said to him, Arise and eat. And then he looked, and behold, and there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So God provides for him. So he ate and drank and laid down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again to a second time and said, and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, ate, and drank, and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. The next story you guys all know this one is when Elijah's in the cave, right? He comes to the cave. And what does it say there in verse 9? The word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You guys know what happens next. Earthquakes and winds and fires come, and the Lord's not in it. Verse 15, jump down. Then the Lord said to him, Go return to your way of the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel king over Aram. There's three very specific things you're supposed to do. You shall anoint Haziel king over Aram. Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shaphat, of that guy, you shall anoint as prophet he actually tells him, i got to put someone else in for you. That's rough. Now, I could put a lot of stuff that I've heard preachers do it. Some people say God was disappointed in Elijah because he ran from Jezebel. Um, I don't know. I, I think I've really learned a whole other side to the Lord that I've run into my cave enough that I don't think the Lord gave up on Elijah at all. Because Elijah still had incredible power and authority. I think instead the Lord was thinking generationally. And the Lord recognized that there was weakness in Elijah. There's nothing wrong with that. The Lord recognizes weaknesses in all of us. So it says, You shall come, it shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel, Jehu shall put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave seven thousand in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with twelve pairs of oxen before him, and he with the twelve. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle, basically his thick, heavy cloak that he walked in, took it off of himself and throws it on to Elisha, who was plowing in the field. And Elijah passed over him, threw his mantle on him. He left the oxen, this is Elisha, and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? It's kind of playing a little hard to get, playing a little like, hey, it's cool, whatever you think. It sounds a little bit like Jesus, when people say to him, Oh, whoa, whoa, I'll follow you, but let me first uh, go bury my father or go do this. You guys know those stories in the New Testament? So he returned from following him, took the pair of oxen, and sacrificed them, and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate. I think this is, that is such a strange verse for me. Because Elisha, just one verse above, says, whoa, whoa, can I go kiss my mom and dad before I follow you? And Elijah's like, whatever, man, do what you got to do. And he comes back, and instead of kissing father and mother, he slays the oxen that he's with, that last pair, that twelfth pair, which I think is also significant, the twelfth pair, the pair of authority. Okay, that's number twelve represents governmental authority. And it says that he sacrifices them, boils their flesh and the implements of the oxen, and then he gave it to the people, and they ate. Just it sounds like Jesus. It just sounds like the Lord. I look for Jesus everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's in Genesis or Revelation or anywhere in between. It just sounds like Jesus. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. And we don't hear again about Elijah until 2 Kings. Sorry, Elisha. Until 2 Kings. Okay? So, now what I want to do is I want to come over here. And I want to draw some parallels. with Elisha. Okay? So jump with me now. We well, don't have to jump. You can just turn. To 2 Kings chapter 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. You guys there? And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel, the house of God. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. 
Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? He said, I know. Just be still. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be still. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. You know what the Jordan represents? You know what it means in Hebrew? It means death. Place of, it's also another word for uh, baptism. And he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Three times. Three times. Does that sound familiar? Where? Peter. Peter? Yeah. Same thing. So it's like, look, wherever you go, I'm going. It's Naomi and Ruth. It's, it's seeing this throughout. Like, there's this covenant. I, we didn't have, it's almost as if when Elisha killed those two animals, he was like cutting covenant. He was saying, look, the old has passed away. And now... New things have come. And I will lay hold of this man, Elijah. And I will lay hold of his, because he's got, who's wearing the mantle? Elisha's wearing the prophet's mantle, yet he still follows Elijah everywhere he goes. That is such a symbol of honor. Incredible. To think that, just like David, who's anointed 16 years before he's ever king, has the anointing of Samuel, Saul is still king. And he still honors him as such. It's powerful. Same thing happens here. Now, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle. Where did he take it from? Had to take it off of Elisha. That's because that's the last we heard about the mantle, right? Elijah took his mantle, folded it together, and struck the waters. And they were divided here and there so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Verse 9. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. Oh, man. He could have never asked him that question had he not been with him. If he would have stayed back in Gilgal, or stayed back in Bethel, or stayed back in Jericho, he would have not been with him at the Jordan to have him ask this question. That's why you don't leave your father. You just don't. This is important. Not only heavenly, not only spiritual father, but also heavenly father. Don't leave him. Okay? And Elisha said, please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Why do you think Elisha asked that question? Why do you think Elisha asked, I want a double portion? Do you think it was just youthful exuberance? Man, what you do is really cool. I want twice whatever you got. Did the Lord tell him to ask for that? Doesn't say that. But because it wasn't for him. Okay. Like it, it, it was for him, but it wasn't for him. So you're saying Elisha knew that it was going to be for others? Yeah. Okay. Puts me in mind of when the Lord asked Solomon. I think it's a good gauge of the heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can have anything you want, Solomon. What do you want, <laughs> man? I want wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As they were going along, and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and of horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried out, what famous words, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into you. Guys, you have to understand, verses 12, verse 12 is a very passionate verse. Filled with, I mean, 
sadness and brokenness that a son is watching his father no longer be with him. This is a guy who was just walking along, plowing his field, and a spiritual father just says, here you go, man, I'm on. I'm on moving on. It's on you now. And from that moment on, you find that Elisha follows him everywhere he goes. And then all of a sudden, the guy he had been following is no longer there. And all he's got now is the mantle. We find out here, verse 13. Took up. Go ahead. I was just thinking about the question you had asked earlier, why he asked for a double portion. I think it's because Elijah, Elijah was everything to him. And that what he wanted to do was just to carry on his tradition, his work, extend his you know, generation, pass it down. So he would need more than what he had to continue the work to make it you know, progress. Because if you're not, not growing, not going further or greater, you're just kind of dying and going backwards. Yeah. It's true. So it's like an honoring thing. It's like, I will be your son. And I'll, I'll, I'll do your more. Own. I'll build what you've done and make it greater. That's really cool. I like that. Verse 13. He took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Huh. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elisha crossed over. So now we see that the same anointing that was on Elijah is on Elisha. And now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw him, they said the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and they bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold now, there are with your servants fifty strong men. Please let them go and search for your master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him and cast him on some mountain or into some valley. And Elisha's like, uh, you don't have to do that. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, go ahead. They sent there 50 men and searched three days and could not find him. And then they returned. And while he was staying at Jericho, he said, did I not tell you don't go? Verse 19. I like Elisha. I just like the spirit of Elisha. I like his nature, his character, his personality. We're going to learn a little bit about him as we read here. Do you mind we're just reading a lot of scripture tonight, right? Okay. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold now, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. And he said, Bring me a new jar and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And we went out to the spring of water, and he threw the salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord. Wait a minute. Oh. Did I miss something? Mm -hmm. Did the Lord ever say anything to Elisha up to this point? Not that we can see. Yet Elisha, out of the blue, in verse 21, says these words. Thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from their death or unfruitfulness any longer. So the waters have been purified to this day according to who? The word, the word of Elisha. So we see here that a theme has already been set up in Elijah where the word of the Lord came to him. But Elisha immediately, did the Lord tell Elisha to smack the Jordan with the mantle? Yeah. Did the Lord tell Elisha to pour salt in the water? No, something happens. A transition is starting to take place. Let's keep going. Then he went up from there to Bethel. Kind of now going backwards from his walk he took with Elijah. It's pretty cool. And as he was going up, by the way, young lads, how many people have heard this story, came out from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. He said it twice. And when he looked behind him and saw them, how many people know you can do this? He cursed them in the name of the Lord. <laughs> do that to your spouse sometime. <laughs> See how that goes for you. The two, then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. He went out from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Did the Lord tell him to do that? No. No. Did two bears, specifically female, 
bears. <laughs> Mama bears. <laughs> Protecting. <laughs> Did they hear the word of the Lord? Oh, they heard the word of Elisha. They heard the word of who? Elisha. Elisha. Mark, would it be safe to guess, before we see saying that God spoke to Elisha, he was, with at least with the mantle, he was repeating what he saw Elijah do. He was mirroring what his father did. I don't know about the salt and the water thing, but it might be a safe guess. And then from that point on, God starts telling him, some of it is God saying, okay, now here's my different plan for you. Like, here's what I want you to do instead. That's what Elijah did. Now here's what I want you to do. Yeah, it's possible. I just wonder why in, in the verses that we see where Elijah does something, the Lord's very specific and has these phrases. Yeah. But why is it that over here we don't see any of that? It's purposely blank. There's a, there's a different lifestyle. I'm going to short, I mean, I really would love to read to you all the stories of Elisha. Even Elisha has a similar experience. Oh, gosh. With a widow. Four. Yeah, chapter, yeah, chapter four. four, right? This is the one where as long as she keeps bringing pots, the oil keeps pouring. You guys know the story? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but a very similar story. Okay? Now, let's just go to the end of chapter three. Yeah, I just want to see this, okay? There's nowhere in here where the Lord's talking to Elisha in chapter 3. Chapter 4. Now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to, my, to take my two children to be his slaves. Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels, do not get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour into all of these vessels and you shall set aside what is full. So she went from him, shut the door behind her and her sons. They were bringing the vessels to her, she poured. And when the vessels were full, she said to her sons, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one vessel more. And the oil stopped. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt. You and your sons shall live on the rest. Did the Lord speak there? No. Now there came a day when Elisha passed over to shoot him. There was a prominent woman, and she persuaded him to eat food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat food. She said to her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God passing by us continually. Same kind of story. Um, the Shunammite son, I, I, could, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of skipping around here, but I need you guys to see this. Senator Servants, women with me. Gehazi. You guys know the story of Gehazi? There's so much I want to get to. I'm trying to cut some of these stories short. Her. All right, I, I should probably do this story too. I, I read most of the Elijah story. I should read this to you. Okay. Verse 18. When the child was grown, the day came that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. And he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Another son dies. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. And then she called to her servant and said, Please send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I might run to the man of God and return. And he said, Why will you go down to him today? It's neither new moon or Sabbath. And she said, It will be well. She's not telling him why. She's not saying the son's dead. It's powerful. It's so much faith. Then she sat on a donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slow down the pace for me unless I tell you to. And so she went and came to the man of God, to Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her at a distance, he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, there is the Shunammite. Please run now to meet her and say to her, It is well with you. Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she answered, it is well. Oh, my goodness. She's not being satisfied with Gehazi. When she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught hold of his feet, and Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone. Who is the man of God? Elisha. Elisha. Isn't it interesting how the name changes even? For her soul is troubled within her, and the Lord, what? 
has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask for a son from my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? There's so much in this story before I forgive me for skipping, but he basically she was she was barren. And Elijah said, This time next year you're gonna have a son. Okay? Again, the Lord never told him that, he just said it. Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up your loins, take my staff in your hands, and go your way. If you meet any man, do not salute him. If any man salutes you, do not answer him, lay my staff on the lad's face. The mother of the lad said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. <laughs> you see what I see? And he arose and followed her. Then Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff on the lad's face, but there was no sound or response. So he returned to meet him and told him, The lad has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, behold, the lad was dead and laid on his bed. So he entered and shut the door behind them both and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay, him, lay on the child, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, stretched himself on him, and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he returned and walked in the house once, back and forth, went up and stretched himself on him, and the lad sneezed seven times. I don't know. And the lad opened his eyes. He called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her, and when she came to him, he said, Take up your son. Then she went in and fell at his feet, bowed herself to the ground, and she took up her son and went out. Keep going. When Elisha heard, returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to the servant, Put on a large pot of soup and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds, came and sliced them and put them into the stew, for they did not know what they were. So they poured it out for the men to eat, and as they were eating of the stew, they cried out and said, O man of God, there is death in the pot. And they were unable to eat, but he said, Now bring meal. He threw it in the pot and said, pour it out for the people that they may eat. There was no harm in the pot. Did God speak? Now a man came from Baalshalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And he said, give them to the people that they may eat. His attendant said, what will I set this before a hundred men? But he said, give them to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord... Where? Where did the Lord say this? They shall eat and have some left over. Does it sound familiar? Five loaves, two fishes. So he set it before them and they ate and they had some left over according to. The word of the Lord? Did the word of the Lord, did the Lord speak? Who spoke? Okay. So the word of the Lord came, hear the word of the Lord spoke. The word of the Lord spoke. Next story is the story of Naaman, who's a leper. Okay? I'm just going to skip that story. You just need to know that he's healed of leprosy by Elisha. I want to get to the story... Oh yeah, chapter 6. This is a fun little story. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold, now the place before you where we are living is too limited for us. Let us go to the Jordan. Each of us take from there a beam, and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. So he said, Go. Then one said, Please be willing to go with your servants. And he said, I shall go. And so he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried out, And alas, my master, for it was borrowed. Did you ever ruin something that you borrowed from somebody else? And you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> then the man of God said, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made iron float. <laughs> and he said, take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and he took it. Anybody ever seen that before? Mm -hmm. Cool little story. Just cuts a stick off. Just walking by. Hmm? Did the Lord tell him to do that? No. No. Cool stuff happening. Now, this is a fun one. Now the king of Aram was warring against Israel, and he counseled with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be, shall be my camp. And the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Armenians are coming down there. 
And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him, and thus he warned him so, so that he guarded himself more than once or twice. Now the heart of the king of Aaron was enraged over this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you tell me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, No, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. <laughs> and it was told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. And he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servants said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. How many are with them? Are with Elisha? His servant and Elisha. And there's an entire army surrounding their tent. And Elisha says that. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. In other words, Elisha is seeing something that other human beings aren't seeing. And he's asking the Lord to open his eyes. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So who's commanding who now? <laughs> Do you see this? The average Christian would think, well, that's a little presumptuous. It's one thing to command the Lord to provide for you. It's another thing to say, you know what, Lord? Strike them all with blindness. So he struck them with blindness. Say it with me. According to the word of of Elisha. Look at this. In Elijah, it's according to the word of the Lord. In Elisha, oh my goodness, I love writing this. This is not heresy. According to the word of Elisha. Here, the Lord speaks and Elijah responds. Here, Elisha speaks and the Lord responds. So he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. <laughs> this guy has got cojones. I'm telling you. He walks up to an army that's seeking to kill him, walks right up to him and says, This way. I and mean, he's just a stud. He's I just love Elisha. When they, came, when they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, O oh Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. <coughs> then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, what? My father. The king of Israel says to Elisha, my father. Shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And he answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Who really took them captive? <laughs> Elisha did. Set bread and water before them. What? Provide for the enemy. Feed the enemy. So he prepared a great feast. Does that sound like anybody? What did Jesus say about his, his enemies? Bless those who curse you. Love your enemies. So he prepared a great feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. And the marauding bands of Armenians did not come again into the land of Israel. You want to, want to have to defeat your enemy? Feed them! I am totally serious. Take care of your enemy and you'll never have to fight them again. Why should? I love this guy. Okay, so I see a parallel here with 
the relationship between Elijah and Elisha. Now, by the way, that's a DBL, which means double portion, in case you're wondering. Okay? All right. So you see a couple things here. First of all, you never once hear, and I think it's specifically written this way, you never once see the Lord said to Elisha. Okay? It's very possible that it happened. It's just never written that way. I think there's a reason. It's also written that way several times, not just once, not just twice, several times. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, and then the Lord commanded people to take care of Elijah. Over here, it's as if everything kind of shifts. In Elisha, now it's like the Lord's like, I'm working with this guy. What does Elisha want to do? I'm going to do it with him. And then when Elisha speaks and says, Lord, do this, the Lord's like, okay. Something transpires. Look, and for me, I, I kind of see this as we have God as master. Over here, we have God as, what do you want to say? Father. Father, okay. Partner. Partner, okay. good. <clears throat> what else are you seeing? How about friend? Okay. Elijah says something, or God says something, Elijah doesn't. Over here, Elisha has this, it's almost as if there's this hidden behind the scenes relationship going on. Like, Elisha already saw the chariots and the angels and all the heavenly host army. But he's like, I'm going to have to help this other guy out. Because the other guy's still living over here. And so let me introduce you to the way of life I'm living. Lord, open his eyes so that he sees the way I see. So far so good? Okay. All right. It's a little bit uncomfortable, right? Yeah. To, to, I'm, I'm cool with God as Father. I'm good with Jesus as brother or as bridegroom or as, but it's hard for me to think of God. So that's like a picture of God coming in a, I'm going to show you how different of a form it is here. All right. So now, jump with me to Malachi. Now we're going to go back to Old Testament. You guys probably know where I'm going, some of you. Malachi chapter 4. Verse 4. Really important. These are the last couple of verses of the Old Testament. Okay? After this, there is a period of time, historically, where there is nothing. Um, there's another book. Anybody ever heard of the book called the Maccabees? Okay? Some people have studied that. I haven't studied it a lot, but I will tell you, it's kind of a time period that's between Malachi and Matthew that gives some historical perspective of what was happening during that time. But here's the last couple of verses of Malachi and the Old Testament. Remember the law of Moses, my servant. Even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Oreb for all of Israel. Verse 5. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So, look. Elijah gets taken up in a whirlwind. He doesn't die. He's one of the few that don't die before they go up to be with the Lord forever. Okay? But then it says right here, the Lord's talking through Malachi, and he says this, Elijah's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back specifically before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So it's a great day. It's a terrible day. Have you ever had one of those days? <laughs> and he has a very specific purpose. Verse 6, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. You want to know why lands are cursed? You want to know why houses are living under something they don't have to live under? It's because fathers and sons are not one. It's because there's not a joining of heart between father and son and son and father. 
So Elijah is going to come again. And he's going to restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Jump now. Let's see where I want to go. Let's go to Matthew 17. Six days later, Jesus took him, Peter, and James, and his brother, John, and led him up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them. Who are the two people we hear about at the end of Malachi? Moses and Elijah. Make sure that you do everything Moses told you to do, and then I'm going to send you Elijah. And so all of a sudden here on the Mount of Transfiguration, they call it the Mount of Transfiguration here. He was transfigured. In other words, he became a different likeness. Okay? It says he's shining like the sun, and his garments are as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is really good to be here. I'm really glad I am. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Have you ever been in one of those moments where you're just kind of like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. And so you just say really dumb stuff. <laughs> I've had those moments. Where I'm really excited about the moment that I'm in. And poor Peter's just like, oh, this is so cool. Let's, how can we make this last longer? Let's build houses. I mean, I love Peter. And Peter's probably like, oh, Mark, I can't wait to meet you in heaven. Because he's going to have some words for me. But it's kind of the way he is. Did you have a question, Kate? Mine, mine's stuck on King James Version because I can't change it from the Wi-Fi. But it says Elias. Is that is another name for, for Elijah? Elijah? Okay. Yep. So Peter says that for, let's, let's build some houses, specifically tabernacles, temples, that each one. And then while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son. It is very purposeful that Moses was there. And I'll show you in Hebrews why in a minute. Okay? Very important that Moses was there because he represented the law. It's very important that Elijah was there because Elijah was the guy that was supposed to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Do you guys know what the great and terrible day of the Lord is? It's a person. And his name is Jesus. For some, he is the solid rock that we have finally found that we can build our lives on. To others, this is all First Peter, he's also the stone we get crushed upon. He's great and he's terrible. I've had moments with Jesus that it's both. I've had moments where I have pure delight and there's moments where I have extreme pain and suffering. Hello? Okay. It's very important that these both are here. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He wanted Moses to hear it. He wanted Elijah, who was also a precursor, a, a, a forerunner. And then he also wanted Peter, James, and John to hear it. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself Verse 9, as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. His disciples asked him, Why then do the, do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Verse 11, he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. What is he going to restore? Fathers to the sons, sons to the fathers. What is the restoration of all things? Fathers to sons, sons to fathers. It's powerful. Jesus says that's the restoration of all things. When fathers and sons become one again. But I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about 
John the Baptist. Okay, so what we have here, so this is, this is Old Testament. And then we've got a break. We've got Malachi 4, 3 through 6. Okay? So we say that, a, they, they, they're saying that Elijah has to come again. Okay? So, Elijah comes, and we find out here in Matthew 17 that Elijah was who? When he came again. John the Baptist. Okay. Okay. So, John the Baptist. Now, there's not nearly as much on John the Baptist as I'd like there to be. Uh, Matthew 3, verse 1, it says this, Now in those days, I'm jumping around, just work with me. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. This guy was a crazy man. <clears throat> Literally a crazy man. <coughs> what did Ahab call Elijah? Remember what he called him? Troubler of Israel. It's exactly how John the Baptist was to all the kings of Israel. Then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. They were being baptized by him as they confessed their sins. Okay? This is the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Okay? So, John the Baptist is in the spirit of Elijah.